Labor Talks was John Verrosier, recorded at Chippewa Valley Community Television in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Hello, this is Labor Talks. My name is John DeRosier, and today our special guest is State Senator Kathleen Weinhout, who represents the 31st Senate District. Did I get it correct this time, Kathleen? Nice to be here. <laughs> nice to Welcome be here. Welcome to Labor Talks. Thank you very much. Um, we do have some questions for you, and I'd like to lead off with the uh, with what's going on uh, with the uh, transportation fund. I know you've been uh, uh, contacting uh, constituents about uh, your concerns with the uh, transportation fund, so please let us know what's on your mind. Well, thank you. It, as many people might have read, there is a question on the ballot in, on November 4th about whether or not the money that is in the transportation fund should be kept just for roads and bridges. And on the surface, this certainly seems like the simple answer is yes, money that comes in for roads and bridges should be kept and used for that. But the, the issue is just a, a little more complicated. And one of the questions that I've had from people is why? Why are we having this discussion about this and where did it come from? And, and is this going to solve the problem? And to understand what's going on, it, I think it helps to go back in time when Governor Doyle faced a Republican Assembly and Senate back when he first started in 2003. And there were differences in how the money should be spent. And in 2003 and then again in 2000, the 2005, before I came to the legislature, there were some vetoes made. And one of those vetoes was to correct a problem in the education world. And the governor decided that he didn't want to take four, some $400 million out of education. And so he used his creative veto of crossing out words and part of numbers and part of sentences, and he used this veto to take money from the transportation fund and put it back in education. Well, some of the Republicans and some of the road builders and some of the people on the Towns Association called foul, and they said, oh, this is bad, you can't do this. And so from that beginning, there was born a movement to put the money in the transportation fund and kind of lock it up, leave it there. And there was a, a series of votes in th two different sessions that would put this amendment on the ballot. Now, all that took a fair amount of time. And during that time, Governor Walker took money from the general fund, which is what, how we pay, with, pay for schools and health care and the UW and local government, he took money from the general fund and put it in the transportation fund, just the opposite of what Governor Doyle did. Well, this really confused people. And so when I tell people, you know, even though we have this transportation amendment, and even if we amend the Constitution and say, no, you can't take money out of this box, we still haven't solved the problem. And people say, oh, my goodness, why haven't we solved the problem? Isn't that why we're voting? And I, I tell them, well, here's the problem. People are driving less, and they're driving more fuel-efficient cars. So the money that's coming in to, for roads and bridges is not keeping pace with the spending. So to solve the problem, even if we keep all that money from, from the motor vehicle, ta vehicle registration and the gas tax, even if we keep it all in there, there's still not enough money. To solve the problem, we've got to come up with either more money or less spending. Both of those are, are difficult. And I found it interesting in this campaign season that no matter who you talk to, Republicans or Democrats, they're all saying about the same thing, which is we shouldn't have done away with the cost of living increase in the gas tax. This was good Dave Senator Zine, uh, Senator Dave Zine. He, he, in 2006, again, before I came in the legislature, he said, well, I don't like this automatic raising of the gas tax, and we are going to do away with that. And so they did away with it, but the problem happened is that the road fund didn't keep up with the cost of repairing the roads, and there were really, really big road projects built in southeast Wisconsin. So 
now both Republicans and Democrats are saying, maybe we ought to either raise the gas tax or raise the fees on registering a vehicle, maybe make the fee um, match the amount of the vehicle so that if, you, if my brother buys a truck for $2,000, he doesn't pay as much to register it as you know, your lawyer friend who buys a truck for 89000 or 50000 that, that costs a little bit more to register. So these are some of the ideas that are being talked about. But in the end, the question of whether or not to keep the money in, in the, in the lockbox that is the transportation fund is not going to solve that shortfall. And the next legislature is probably going to have to come up with a new way to either spend less on roads or come up with more money or some combination of both. Mm -hmm. And that's probably more of an answer than you ever expected. You did just fine. <laughs> well, <thank laughs> you, did you. Not, you did not disappoint <laughs> us one bit. I used to be on the county board, mm -hmm. and I've talked to people who were on the transportation committee, and I have a hunch that they will appreciate what you're saying because, quite frankly, that money filters down to the county level, and they should respect what you're saying because this, in the long run, means more money for county, for county roads and highways, correct? Well, certainly if the money is there, what has happened over time is that more money has gone to really large road projects in southeast Wisconsin, and not nearly as much money has gone to maintaining the roads and coming back to the counties to, to clear the roads and to take care of it. And you know from being on the county board, there's this kind of unique arrangement the state has with the counties, which are that the counties are going to maintain the roads that are in, some of the roads that are in their jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. and, but in order to do that they've got to have the money and there hasn't been near enough money in the past. Local government has been about flat funded and the costs because of the cost of gasoline and asphalt and concrete and all those things have gone up but they have the money that the state pays the counties hasn't kept up with the increase in costs and this is one of those problems that that can't go on forever it needs to be addressed. Thank you I think two key words are flat funded right there. Yeah. Now, I wanted to start out talking about the transportation fund, which means that I skipped my first question. Okay. But then, of course, I'm always used to doing things backwards. So, tell us a bit about yourself and why you first ran for public office. Well, thanks. I appreciate that. I, my husband and I run an organic farm in Alma Township in Buffalo County. I have one son who is starting his first semester of college up in St. Paul. And we have a lot of interesting discussions in my house about local government because my husband both serves on the school board and as chair of the Buffalo County Board. And right now, as you know, the, it's budget season and the kitchen table is completely spread out with all the kinds of details of the county's budget as they're trying to figure out how to close a big hole in, the, in Buffalo County's budget. I first ran for office in 2006. Uh, I, I was a dairy farmer. I had spent 10 years running the family's dairy farm, doing the milking of the cows and the breeding and the taking care of all the young stock and all that. And I and my family I didn't have health insurance. And one of the things that I wanted to do when I got to Madison was to bring affordable health insurance to farmers. And that definitely took up a good part of my first term and we were successful in making some changes in the law even before the changes were made at the federal lo level with the Affordable Care Act. For example, one of the bills that I wrote that was passed into law was that adult children could stay on their families' policies for health insurance up to age 27. Now, the Republicans repealed that when, when the Affordable Care Act passed and the federal law became age 26, but it gives you an idea of some of the things that I did at the beginning. So I've, I've been in the legislature now for two terms. The terms are four years, and I'm right now running for my third four-year term. Do you see any possibility of cooperation between the two parties, between the Democrats and the Republicans, especially if the Democrats increase their numbers? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I serve on the audit committee, and because the 
the Democrats and the Republicans have switched several times in terms of who's in the majority. I have gone from being the chair of the audit committee to being the ranking minority member to back to being the chair to back to being the ranking minority member. And during this time, my Republican, the now Republican chair, um, uh, Senator Rob Coles from over sort of in the Green Bay area, he and I have worked together on, on a number of different issues. Audit, it sounds kind of dull and boring, but it's actually a really fun committee for me. It gets in the, the committee gets into the details of how state government works, and I really like learning about those details of how the, how the administration works. I um, have written several bills to try and fix things that were problems. One of them, you might remember, something called the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation. Mm -hmm. The Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation was started this private-public partnership where the governor is the chairman and the CEO of, of the chairman of the board and the CEO of the company. Uh, but the company is really all state government. The vast majority of money comes from state government and is technically an authority, which is part of state government. But we had done an audit, the, the Legislative Audit Bureau and the, the authorized by the Audit Committee, and found out that in that organization were hundreds of millions in tax credits and, and tens of millions in grants and loans going out the door of all the money being spent in the first two years of this, this new invention, there were zero jobs that were verified, meaning uh, the the auditors or the, the the state sits down and says, okay, you said you were going to give us 40 jobs, and I see at your payroll you've only had 20 jobs, and that means you need to give us back the tax credits we gave you for those 20 jobs you haven't delivered on. That never happened once, not once. Never was there any kind of a verification that the jobs that were promised actually got delivered. So. I worked with my colleagues on the audit committee and I came up with a bill that tightened the regulations for what the rules were for this operation. And my then chairman of the audit committee on the Senate side, Rob Coles, took the bill and he changed it and he made it better and he put the audit committee's name on it and we passed it and then later on got passed partly by the assembly and part of it became law. Now this is a good example of Harry Truman's old quote that goes something like, if you don't care who gets the credit, it's amazing what you can get done. And I found that the best way for me to get bills passed in a legislature that was controlled by the Republicans was to either give my idea to a, a Republican and ask them to put their name on it, or have the committee itself take up the bill and put the committee's name on it, which at that point it becomes bipartisan. So that's kind of a long answer to a very practical approach to getting things done when I'm in the minority and I need to work with the Republicans to get things done. I have two questions. The first one is just begging to be asked. Are you a policy wonk? <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> well, people have called me that before. <laughs> Okay. So I do enjoy policy. Okay. My next question is this. What can unions be doing to protect and increase women's rights? Well, that's a very good question. And I think the first step to that is to make union members aware of what's actually happening to women's rights. And there are just a long list of very bad bills that have been passed by the Republican-dominated legislature in the last few years. And we can start with the Equal Pay for Equal Work Law, which was a, a bill that I can't believe anybody would disagree with, that women should have the right to um, stick up for themselves and, and take to court any employer, take to state court any employer who, who is discriminating against them because they're gender. But then there are a whole lot of other issues that are related to women's reproductive rights that have been just punitive bills that are designed to shut down Planned Parenthood and shut down the services that, that they offer to many, many poor women. And so the first step that the unions can do is to 
make their members aware, to help educate them on what's happening. The second step is to help engage them in a discussion with other members and with their neighbors. And the third step is to help those union members become leaders in their neighborhood to get the vote out, to get people to the polls that support women's rights, that support union rights, that support a, a common sense approach to solving the problems of state government. And too much of what I'm seeing is, is grandstanding by the governor because he thinks he wants to run for president, which is a scary thought. My humble opinion. Well, I agree with your humble opinion. <laughs> I really do. Act 10. Now, you're sitting down in Madison, and from that perspective, has Act 10 negatively affected public employees, and if so, how? Oh, in, in many, many ways. The most direct is that people have somewhere between four, five, six thousand dollars $6,000 less a year in their pocket. And this has a ripple effect to the whole community all over the state. Communities are paying as people are not going, but they're not going out to eat. They're not buying new furniture. They're not buying new cars. I had a car dealer in Madison say that after Act 10 passed, that car dealer had the worst year ever in the history of the car dealership because public employees didn't have any extra money to buy a new car, if they, even if they needed a new vehicle. But further than that, and perhaps maybe just as bad, is that there has been a a devastating effect on the morale of public employees. Whether we're talking about the, the technical wizards that work with the com state's computer system or the, uh, the technical people that assist the DNR or the people that work in the Department of Health, all the different functions of state government, as well as the universities, the teachers, the local government employees, all of these people feel underappreciated. They feel under attack and they feel like they may do better off for their family if they're not working in state service. And that is very, very bad for the future of the state. We want to attract the best and the brightest and keep them both working in state service and local government and at our universities and tech colleges. So there has been a, a ripple effect of Act 10 throughout our economy, and I've just begun to scratch the surface on the problems that the state faces. But hiring and keeping good employees certainly at the top of the list. Um, it's not just happening with state employees. As I pointed out, I was on the county board, and I don't want this conversation to be about me. But I did notice because I would talk to public employees at the county level. Mm -hmm. And I think it's happening, well, the situation you just described about low morale is happening at the state level, yep. it's happening at the county level, it's happening at the city level. Yep. And if this continues... The schools. Thank you very much. The yeah. schools, yeah. And, and, uh, and point blank, if we don't have, if we can't retain high quality public employees, services, are going to suffer, and that means the public will suffer, and that means that people are going to be voted out of office. Well, that that might happen. That might, and it, and that's maybe why I'm said, wrong. I hope so. Going back to the to the union question, how how do we get people involved? A part of the problem is that many people are so burned out, the teachers, the union members, that they kind of want to sit out this election, and and that's that's maybe. Maybe it makes you feel a little better, but it's not going to solve the big picture problem. Thank you very much. <laughs> you just bailed me out. <laughs> <laughs> so you're in agreement there. <laughs> um, union members have been described as thugs, and I am a union member, and I definitely support unions, and I hope to God I haven't treated you as if I'm some kind of a thug. Well, you know, I think that when people call names like that, it's generally done to distract the public that's watching from what's really happening. And mm -hmm. I have seen over and over again the leaders in this state 
who kind of think that the public has, has the attention span of a cocker spaniel, and they bounce a silver ball up and down over here and say, look at this, look at this, while at the same time they're grabbing the, the goodies over here and giving, the, giving all the cookies and the desserts to their friends, and, and then the average working person is saying, hey, what about me? Well, what is it that these guys pay zero in taxes and I, I got to pay full price? That's just not, that's not fair. Do you mean to tell me that people like the Koch brothers and that, uh, and that fellow from Sheldon Adelson from uh, Las Vegas, do you think that they're the ones who are reaping the benefits off to the side while the rest of us get peanuts? Well, I think that there's certainly evidence that there are certain companies in this state that are paying zero or close to zero in corporate income tax. And I would say that the corporate CEOs ought to at least pay the effective rate of their secretaries, which sometimes doesn't even happen. Which leads me to my next to last question. Will your Democratic Party try to increase state revenues for education and community television? Well, I, I know how to make a plug. <laughs> Certainly community television has been hit badly, and that's partly because of some changes that were made during the deregulation of the cable industry, which was a bill that, that I fought very hard and came close to helping, pa helping stop, but every time we got close, somebody would change their vote and, and we would lose. And I, I will do everything I can to try and get that funding for the PEG channels returned. I, I also am fighting and will continue to fight to change the school funding formula to get additional funds for different, different problems that the schools are facing, whether it be still children in poverty, children that need special ed, rural schools that have high costs just to open the door, um, children that, that maybe don't have English as a first language. All of these children cost more to educate, which is why we need to change the funding formula. But getting all of the Democrats to agree on anything is no small task. So I can't make a promise about what all of the Democrats will do, but definitely I will tell you I will be down there advocating for these things that we've talked about. You'll try. Absolutely. That's the and I will line. write the bills and I will bring them up as amendments and I will say to my colleagues, okay guys, please support these amendments. And I've gotten some of them to agree, but not all of them quite yet. Two final questions. Act 42, can you tell me or tell the audience what Act 42 did to uh, community television? The, this is what I just mentioned when I talked about the deregulation of the cable industry. Yep. And there were many different parts to this. It was pushed by AT&T and uh, sort of an unholy alliance of the cable companies themselves that compete against AT&T. And the whole idea from the perspective of the people that supported the legislation was to uh, modernize the regulations and allow for new technology. Now, granted, there was new technology and there were things in the statute that needed to be modernized, but slipped into this bill was a, a way to take away funding for community television and to take away consumer protection for cable companies from cable companies, so consumer protection for the customers. So for example, if you lost your service and it stayed out for three or four days, the cable company can't turn around and bill you for that service that you didn't have through no fault of your own. So there were many things that were wrong with that bill and I tried very hard to raise the alarm as did the, the public access channels all across the state, but we were definitely um, had an uphill battle. <laughs> well, is there anything else you'd like to add? Any questions I didn't ask that you, you wish I had a asked, or is there anything else you want, you want to add? This is going to be a very, very close election, and Western Wisconsin is going to be key to who wins statewide and, of course, who wins in the Western Wisconsin seats. And the control of the Senate is at stake, and the control of the who becomes governor is at stake. And it's very, very important that people get out and vote and bring their friends and neighbors to the polls. We're um, right now looking at 17,000 people in our Senate district that only vote when the president is on the ballot. That's enough to win a statewide race 
and definitely enough to get myself and, and other people elected. So I strongly encourage everyone who's listening to talk to their friends and neighbors and get to the polls. It's very important to vote. And there is no voter ID required. And many, many people very are true. very confused about that because it's gone one way and another and one way and another. And now we're looking at the election coming up and they do not have to have a voter ID in order to vote. Maybe later, but not this election. You represent the rural area. Mm -hmm. What do you do to get the rural vote? We have to take a different approach. And that's because people don't have broadband necessarily. Even the community of Ellsworth at large doesn't have broadband. Um, people maybe have cell phones that don't work in the, in the hills. And so what I have been doing is holding what I'm calling neighborhood or community conversations in both Eau Claire and in the rural areas. This is a way for people to meet their neighbors, to get out and maybe see some, visit somebody that they haven't had a chance to visit before, and gather together with a group of people and talk about what's important, what's happening in their community, what's happening in Madison, how, who they vote for, and what happens in Madison affects their community. And it's been a way to do what I would call community organizing. And it's actually been quite effective, this campaign. And I think that's about it. That's all I have to say. Do you assume that uh, this isn't the most polished uh, uh, end to my show, to our show? Well, it's but a it's, pleasure to be here it's today. It's the best I can do. <laughs> well, <laughs> thank you very thank much you, for your work. Oh, okay. Chippewa Valley Community Television is made possible by continuing community support. If you would like to volunteer or make a donation, you can contact us by calling 715-839-5067 or on the web at www.cbctv.org.